Next up from Sweden, we have Samuel Casper. So Samuel is a senior custom engineer at Microsoft who has been with the conference for multiple years meanwhile. And today, um, Sam takes us through setting up build and uh, deploy pipelines for BizTalk server projects uh, by using Azure DevOps. And in between, he shares tips and tricks to make your deployment successful. So Samuel, the floor is all yours. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for having me. So today we're going to talk about building and releasing your BizTalk applications using Azure uh, DevOps. So what to expect from the session and what not? Uh, you shouldn't expect the perfect process. It's your job to make all these techniques and create the, the pipelines that are perfect for your context. Uh, but you can expect to get a, a lot of uh, tips and tricks to uh, handle your uh, BizTalk project deployments. Uh, I will demo a number of things that you can use with uh, Azure DevOps, but also if you have other tools, so I have implemented this with the customers that actually have uh, not a single thing within Azure DevOps and, and it works. So you, you have a, a set of scripts that I share, uh, I already shared on my GitHub repo uh, where that you can use in, in your deployment. So just to have fun. So if we look a little bit on the, the playground we have today, uh, we have a number of VMs that I have in Azure. Uh, and um, the environment looks like I, I have the, this uh, self-hosted build agent that I need for, for BizTalk. I have a dev environment that is one single machine that is uh, yeah dev that I will be doing the deployment to. And I have uh, my test environment that is two BizTalk servers. Uh, and a SQL Server uh, cluster in the backend. Uh, I have used uh, Git for my repos. I, I used two of them. I used the BizTalk build artifacts. There is a repo where I have common components, uh, scripts that I will use on several different projects uh, that I will deploy. And then I have the project itself that I will be deploying, and that's a BTS car sample that is just a uh, based of projects, so to say. Uh, I will be using artifacts. So uh, I will uh, de deploy some of the components as NuGet packages to the art artifacts collections. And of course, we will be using uh, the Azure pipelines for that. Uh, the, I have chosen to install agents uh, on all the servers where I have the Azure DevOps mark here. Uh, I prefer to have local execution. Uh, that makes the, the testing and the creating the scripts a lot simpler. So that, that's my choice, but it's completely possible to create scripts that actually does the deployments uh, remotely. Uh, if we look at the test environment where I have multiple servers, I have uh, I consider BTS1 as the primary server uh, and BTS2 as, as a secondary. And as we will see later, I will do a little bit different things on them. Uh, for secrets, I have chosen to save them in, uh, in release vari in, in variables in, in my releases. I could have used uh, Key Vault instead. So it's, it's a question of of choice uh, during this setup. Uh, in a production environment, I probably would use Key Vault. But if you're using some other uh, Vault, you could probably adapt uh, your setup to, to use that. For packaging, I have chosen to use the BizTalk application project that came together with the task that the for for Azure DevOps that the product group released. So uh, if we start talking about the build server, uh, but before that we are going to start to do some have it to work a little bit. So if we go to my pipelines, here I have a pipeline that I want to get triggered. So I will just do a little change here. So I trigger a build. 
So I save that. Something like that. And now it should have started. So now we have that. So while that works, that will take a while, we talk a little bit about the build server. It's quite straight, straightforward actually to set it up. Uh, in my environment, I have an updated Windows. Uh, I have installed the .NET 4A targeting package and the entire Visual Studio 2019. If you look at the description of uh, the, the Azure pipeline agent, it should be enough with the build tools, but it's not enough for the Bistock projects uh, because you will need the, the Bistock server Visual Studio extension, something that I have installed also. Uh, I have also installed Bistock server developer edition on the machine, um, including the prereqs, but I haven't configured it. it it's just um, the the, the server itself. So, um, and the pipeline is installed on it. And if we look at uh, my agent pools, here I have my the pool where I have my agents for uh, Bstock 2020. And this is the one that is online at the moment. And if we look here, we have a number of capabilities. Uh, and there is one that I'm especially in interested in, and that's the BTS install path. You know, that's the environment variable that when you install this, it, it, it's added. So that one I will be used uh, use later. So I ensure that uh, when my build starts, it's actually get directed to uh, one agent that is. Um, the one that I uh, want to have. So uh, then we have the artifacts library. So you, you're, you today you're used to using NuGet packages, and it's extremely easy to actually create your own feed where you can place your own um, your own NuGet packages. And for Bistock, you have a lot of components. Uh, that, uh, that you might want to have. Let's say you have some canonical schemas, you have some pipeline components that you want to have, or some libraries that you want to have. Why not publish them as, uh, as NuGet packages instead of eventually, the worst case, having a, a, just a project reference? So if you go to the artifacts section in your project, here you have, you can create a feed. So just click on, uh, on create feed and you give it a name and configure it. Uh, and you will have, um, uh, you will have the, the feed ready to, to be used. I have already uh, published the schema here. Uh, if I want to connect to this feed, just click on connect. And here you have a list of different uh, tools that you can use to uh, to, to access this. And for Visual Studio, I'm interested here in, in this. So here you have an exact description on how you do, and this is something you need to do on all the, on, on all the server, sorry, all the developer machines. Uh, so let's go to a developer machine and we go to this project, uh, wrong. this one. Uh, and if I go to tools and options, I have the NuGet package manager, and here I have the package sources. So here I can have a plus and then just paste the, the link that I, uh, that I had, uh, copied, and then give it a good name. And then uh, just you, you actually have it accessible from this project. I've already done that. So here I have, if you see my project that I have at the moment, NuGet org. If I change to my Bistock 2020 artifacts, I have the NuGet package there. And then I install this schema and I have the reference. And I know that this is the schema that the, the version that we actually want to have.
So going back to the slides, if we look at the, the Bistock server application, uh, it packages the, the results. So when you build, it packages to a zip file. Uh, the conf how the zip file will look like is something that you describe in the Bistock server inventory JSON. Uh, I have created a script that I, sh I share in the GitHub repo that helps you adding, if you haven't done that already, uh, it, it can add uh, the project to your solution and update references and doing uh, some scaffolding that you will need. In this, you need also binding. So when you're going to deploy, you will need to deploy um, and have the bindings included in your package. But some values will differ from from dev to test to production. So you will need, so you, you need to have some way of actually when you're doing your release to use the current values. So uh, the proposed solution is that you replace these values like here, you have the address and you have the handler and so on uh, that you replace with a token instead of a value. Uh, you will also, among the examples, you will have a script that helps you uh, get started with actually automating this. So you actually go into and replace these values um, with, with tokens that you can then later on uh, work with. When you build, something else will happen. Uh, the file will, the, the, the JSON file, the inventory file will be changed. And it, they will add all the tokens that you have in, in, in your binding file will be added to the tokens list. So if you're implementing later on your own solution to do replacement of these tokens, you actually have a list of what tokens you should expect to have. If we take a look at the project uh, that I have, it's this one. It's a quite standard uh, business project. So I have, you see, we have transform transforms, we have schemas, orchestrations, library, and so on. Uh, and here I have the Bistock server application project. Uh, I open the inventory file and we see that we, here, we have the different DLLs that I need. If it's a, a Bistock artifact, I, uh, I, add it to the Bistock assemblies. Uh, if it's bindings, you add it to the bindings, of course, collection, and then you have the assemblies that are other things that, uh, other assemblies that you want to have. And also you have the deployment sequence. The deployment sequence is in which order you're going to um, do your release. So, so in this case, we're going to, uh, deploy first the, the library, then we take the schemas, the transforms, and so on, and finally the bindings. Uh, and if we look at the bindings file I have here, we can see that I have done some replacements that I already showed you, and I have further uh, some more here in the transport type data. You see that I have like username and password for my SFTP user. And uh, then we have one more thing that is interesting here, and that is the schema. I wanted the schema project to end up finally in my artifacts collection as a new package. For that, I need a specification. So I have this file, the new spec file, just describing uh, how the package should look like and what should be included in it. Uh, so, th so that is um, the, what will be used later on on the build um, to uh, to do the deploy. So let's go to the slides again. So now I have my build, uh, and I will do a couple of things. But before that, we uh, go through this. We go and look at the results of the latest build that we did. So we go to our pipelines 
and we have the integrate rocks execution. And we look at the job, and here we see the results after the pipeline ended. So we see that we have one artifact, and in the artifacts collection, we have the NuGet package and the, the zip file that contains the, the project itself. And I go back here. Uh, if I look at the job, I see all the steps that I have taken. And if we go into the edit the pipeline itself, we do some suing so you see better. And I've done a couple of things here. So I have one repo, as I told you before, with a scripts that I will reuse over and over again in different uh, in different builds, so to say. Uh, so here I have I include the with the name build build artifacts. I include the repo uh, Bistock 2020. That is the name of my uh, project, and then the name of the repo itself, and which branch I'm going to use on that one. Uh, then next thing I have is that I have I have to say okay what pool I am going to build my uh, do, do my build on and that will be the SK twenty twenty dev pool and then I have the demand BTS install path because eventually you have several servers in your pool that eventually have uh, different capabilities and some of them don't have the BizTalk installed. Eventually, you have uh, build agents that you want to build uh, one for 2016 and one for 2020, let's say. Then you could have your own environment variable and decide out of that, uh, adapt uh, the, um, the demand uh, to address that. If we look further on here, uh, I it's normal stuff. Uh, here I use, I have a, one of the scripts that I uh, use uh, that comes in the build artifacts um, in repo. And it cre the, the build, when I download the, the, the data, it creates a folder uh, with the name of the repo. And there you have all the scripts as accessible. So I, I call this one to set the assembly file version of uh, info file version of uh, of my DLLs. Then I do some copying uh, and building, and uh, then finally I create the, the new Git package and publish, so we get the result uh, that we were looking at. So going back to this presentation. So I linked in the, the, the repo, uh, the extra repo, so to say. Uh, I had my demand, so I addressed the right uh, pool. And then I used the scripts that I have in common. And we saw the packages, both, both the NuGet package and the zip file as the result of the build. So now we have, uh, now we have a couple of packages. Uh, you could have done here before in, in the build, you could have done the, um, the release to the artifacts collection yourself uh, in that. But I decided that I want to do that myself. I want to control when things happen there. So if I go to my releases, here I have the BTS car sample schemas artifact. And I can create a release for that, and it will end up uh, when it's done. It's queued, and finally we will uh, and we will have the artifact here in my artifacts collection. That takes a little while, so meanwhile we start looking at deploying. So. When deploying, I have created 
uh, one deployment group for each environment. So a deployment group is, a so to say, a collection of targets. So uh, look here, and I have uh, two deployment groups. I have the beast of death. Uh, and I see that I have one target there. And I have tests where I have the two servers. And we see what releases have been released on them. So uh, then we um, we have start <laughs> we'll start doing the work. Uh, and for that I use PowerShell. Uh, and I want to be proactive. I want to have as little downtime as possible if downtime is needed. So I want to check on things before I actually start doing some validation, is, is doing some deployment. So I do some validation. So, and that could be uh, checking, do we have any active instances? Uh, is my application uh, referred by other ones? So I have other applications that are dependent on them. Uh, and that kind of thing, so it could be like, with um, with one customer, we did checks here at at this, uh, at this stage. We actually did the validation of the bindings, so we act actually could see if the if we had some uh, mix up with servers. So so we have like for for the dev environment, we have a list of allowed servers. Uh, or disallowed server. So we, we we did a check anyway that uh, verified that the, in the bindings we only had uh, servers that we were interested in. And that, and that was due, of course, of some problems we had along the way. Uh, so if we look at the, the validation, we go to the developer machine, um, look here in the check application. So here I have a script that checks. Uh, it uh, you get the the, the Bistock application in this in this case in this pipeline. I don't care about it, so I haven't done anything about it. But next next thing is I'm checking if I have any instances that are live. So we. Uh, and if we look here, uh, what I'm doing is that I'm calling the operational data service. So I'm saying, okay, go to the instances on the filter on properties application, and it should be the name of the application that I'm deploying now. And I get top one. So the first instance, and I'm just interested in one. If I have one instance, I have to, I want to fail. If I fail calling, if the call fails for some reason, I write an error and I return as if I had some instances. And then I will fail here saying, hey, this application has instances. And then I uh, fail. And the same with back references. For back references, I use um, the management service. Well, those are quite quick. Um, it works very, very, very fast, a lot faster than if you would do it with uh, WMI or uh, Explorer OM. So if we go here and we go to my pipelines and the releases, and we see that I have here a release 61 here done a lot of re releases last time, uh, last couple of days. Uh, and we have one that succeeded in uh, development and now it's ready for going to test. So I approve this and it will start deploying. Now it's downloading and we will come soon, come to the validation here. And when it ex executes the script, it fails. 
and it fails because the car sample ex had instances and it does it on both servers. So that way I didn't go forward and executing things that would give me more, more job. Uh, so next, next thing that I do is I change the values um, in, in the bindings files. Uh, so I, I use a component tokenizing archive that goes into the zip file, uh, opens the, the bindings files and replaces all the tokens that I have with the values that I have uh, in variables in my, uh, in my pipeline. So if we go and look at the pipeline, and we go here. And uh, we check here, sorry. Here we have for the different environments, I changed like this. Sorry, I have to, yeah. So here we see that I have values for test and dev. Uh, and these are the tokens that I'm going to replace. For common variables that I reuse over, over and over, I have variable groups. And it will, if I would use Key Vault, I would link in uh, as a variable group um, the values from Key Vault in here that way. Uh, then I will extract the files and start deploying my application. Uh, we get back to that and check on the scripts. Then finally, we're, uh, or after that, we're going to delete the bindings and the zip file because we have secrets in there. So that's, it's important to, uh, to do that. Uh, so you don't have secrets lie, lying around there and then start the application. I have chosen to use the PowerShell provider and that doesn't work with the 64 bit. So if I want to, if I do a choice like that, uh, and, and I, there are some components in, uh, with Vistock administration that don't work on 64 bit, then you can restart the PowerShell script uh, with um, start itself, but start it in the 32 bit um, session and that works perfectly. And here you have an example, a little function, and you provide uh, values for that, and it will restart itself, and that works perfect. So I told you validation using the operational data service. Uh, you can uh, check instances and back, back references uh, using the management service. And here you see an example of the uh, back references. And we have looked at the partial script. Uh, and we have looked also in the, into the values of, of, and variables that will be in the, that we will be replacing in the files. The secrets, as I told you, as variables, secret variables in the, in the pipeline, uh, or you can use keyboard. Um, again, delete your bindings uh, when you're done. Then we come to uh, deploying the application. You have a couple of different choices here. You can use partial provided, that, that was the choice I did. Uh, you can use BCS task, you can, uh, also used for, for app, at least for the application, you can use the management API. Um, so for BTS task, you have the, the, the product group created the, the BSTOC server application deployment task. If you want to get inspired from that, if you want to use BTS task, you can get a lot of inspiration there. Uh, so you, on your service, if you use it one time, you will get the, the scripts there and you can look in, into them and get inspired or use them. It's completely okay to do that. I prefer to do it this way, just to tweak it a little bit more uh, than that. I differentiate between primary and secondary servers. We will see that 
uh, in this moment, we need to delete and create or update application. That is something that you choose. I have chosen to delete and create. And then we add and write the resources if, if we have them there. And we set a description. Use that. It's really a good tool. So if we go to my server here, I have a script that is called install this toxic package. And we look here, I import a module, GAC module, that is uh, really, really nice. Uh, and uh, another module that I have written myself. Uh, and then I check, okay, if I'm the primary, so I have this, this variable, uh, environment variable that I set, if it's primary, okay, then I will remove the application. Then I create a string with some information that will end up in the description of the application. And then we create the application. So if we look at the environment, and if we look at the properties here, we see the description. And one of the things that we can see here is what release did we use. And I think this is quite handy. I've used it in, in in real cases and it's really valuable information. We even had information on who triggered, we had manual, we did manual releases, we could include the information who actually started the release. Um, and then if, if this is the secondary, we don't do anything. Uh, and then uh, we process the inventory and there we have just take the JSON file uh, that we had from the BSTOC application project. And then if it's the primary, we have a for each looping in the deployment sequence. So we get everything in the right order. And then we add BSTOC assembly, just assembly, and finally import the bindings. So we just loop, do everything in the right order. And if it's this is the secondary server, we just uh, call the add GAC assembly and we get the things in place. So, so we have seen uh, that we have um, we have done uh, build. We have resources that we have published to uh, our artifacts collection. And we have seen that we uh, could do a release where we validated things before uh, we actually did the, the release. Uh, you have all the scripts in, the, uh, in my GitHub repo. So here I created a, a new folder. And here you have some utils uh, and you have the deployment uh, scripts there. And then you have uh, the GAC module for PowerShell in the, in the PowerShell gallery and the tokenize in, the, uh, in Archive in the Visual Studio Marketplace. And if you look later on the shared uh, slides, you have in the slides, uh, not on all, but in most of them, you have links to more information on the different topics that I talked about there. Uh, I think we are good in time. Is that correct? Yeah, yes, Samuel. I guess we have another 10 minutes, no problem. Okay, perfect. So then we can show just a little bit here. Uh, the, sorry, there. Uh, no, wrong place. So here we had on the we had the suspended instance. I terminate in the test environment like that. Now it's gone. So now we can go to my pipeline again that had failed. And I say, okay, redeploy.
or we approve. So now it's in progress. And now, now when this is done, uh, it should be passing. So while this is working, so you actually see that it worked, uh, we can start looking at uh, questions. Do we have any questions? There are a few questions yeah. uh, in the Q and A tab. Are you able to access the questions of the Q and A tab, Samuel? Yes. Or would you like me to read it out for you? Uh, we can. I can see them. Uh, benefits and drawbacks using uh, MS deployment JSON versus using BTDF. Uh, I mean, if you already have a fully working uh, BTDF, I don't see that I would change that process. If you so, if you if you already have a, a really good process, I I wouldn't do that much about it. I, I would stick to that if you don't have a, any issues. Uh, so, so it's, uh, yeah, th I think that's, uh, that's my point on that. Um, what is the advantage exposing this artifact assemblies in your Git package? Uh, yeah, well, you, you have, sometimes you have, I've seen a lot with, with, with a lot of customers and uh, when you, even if you're the, the only consumer, I've seen a lot of customers that actually have, okay, they, they have the repo. And instead of lifting in the binaries, just, just a reference to the binaries, they are including the project into the, the solution. And, and then they, sometimes they do a change without thinking about it, having a, the project reference, including a, a project in, uh, uh, in, in another solution, they infer some changes that are uh, not good. So I think it's a better practice to things that you will reuse, like a schema that is canonical, you release it as a binary that you include. So that, that's my point on doing that. Uh, and I think, okay, that was a response. Uh, Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you, you can definitely use the task. So, so how about uh, Microsoft deploy BizTalk application uh, instead of custom PowerShell? You can absolutely do that. So it's more if you want to do more, more tweaking on that. So, so it's, this is just an alternative to, to other solutions. So there is no, so, so it's, it's better, I would say, depending on what you like. I, I, from my perspective, I can tweak this process a little bit more. And also for me, it's interesting that I work uh, with customers that don't just use Azure DevOps. So, so that's uh, one of the things. Uh, can the pipelines be access controlled? Uh, yeah, yes. I mean, you have, oh, ooh, let me see the pipelines. Uh, yes, I'm quite sure you can do that, uh, that you, you create, you have different users for, for the service that does uh, the release. I'm not that expert on Azure DevOps, so, so that I would direct that question to, to a, DevOps, a DevOps expert, but I'm quite sure you can, you can fix that, yes. Um, so when releasing to multiple Bistock server configured as cluster task, use the Bistock server application deployment in release pipeline. After release to each server, deployed application is starting automatically. For now, we are stopping the host instances and doing the releases. How to control this? So if, you, if you're doing the releases this way, you control when you actually start the applications again. So, so that's one of the points of, 
of tweaking the process and, and doing that with your own scripts. Uh, this deployment framework, it has a setting uh, how to start application on deploy or something like that, just set it to false, okay. Uh, but that was, I'm not sure that was the application, the, the piece of deployment framework. I think it was two different things. Um, how are we doing on time? I think we have a couple of minutes more. So the, the best of deployment DevOps task creates shares on the best of server that it never cleans up. Any reason for that? I have no idea. It's a choice they did. And um, I would introduce, uh, like in this, I haven't included any cleaning up of, uh, of the, this, these folders. So that is, if I look to the, um, uh, with the customers where we have implemented this, we have implemented some kind of cleanup, just keeping the, the last two or something like that. Uh, deployments on the servers. Uh, yeah, so it's, but I can't respond on why they did that choice. Uh, hello, Kai. Uh, how do we avoid getting lots of pipelines if we have hundreds of business applications? Um, mm, well, you, you, you will probably have, uh, have, a pipeline for each application that you do, but you can create your um, like templates to do that. Uh, you have to direct that question to uh, to a DevOps expert how you eventually could tweak this to to be more flexible. But I would that would eventually mix up a little bit applications to applications. Um, do we need to create PS uh, PowerShell files before and include them on the artifacts uh, and then execute the pipeline? Uh, so the, these, these PowerShell uh, scripts is something that I have written. So yes, you have to, if you want to tweak the, the process, you have to, to write or adapt the, the PowerShell scripts here. So it's nothing that is, added for you, but, but so, so it's more a way of handling that. Thank you for your time uh, and enjoy Integrate 2021. Covey.com.